All right, so um, I hope you guys had a good time in um, presenting to one another. Was it good? Was it helpful? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, good. I'm yeah. Finally, you have time to actually interact with each other. I'm well. I'm glad that happened. Um, I hope you had fun in your groups. Anyone want to like t do a quick like key takeaways, or you want to keep moving forward? Because we will do presentations later too. But any quick comments? We had a question about the format. Like, sure. do you want us to do the NGSS plan? Can we just do a PowerPoint and show? Uh, what do you Whatever want? you want to do, basically. It, so, like I said, it's very flexible. Um, you can present however way you present, whatever makes sense to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm glad that worked. Any other, any questions? Yeah, coming out of that or... Um, so um, I did email you just now, so please make sure to check your email. So there's the post survey. Please, please do that. Um, again, this is just me begging, is to please do it because that's how we get funding every year. And then again, with the post survey, if you don't wanna do it digitally, you can just draw it on a piece of paper, then take a photo and upload it. A lot, I think a lot of you did that. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. That's, I'm done with my begging. Okay, so then next is most important, obviously, is to um, pay you for your, your participation because all of you, I think, did a great job. Um, I was popping into some of the breakout rooms. I don't know if you saw me sneakily spy on you, but um, all of you have been doing such a great job and I really applaud you for just being so engaged, honestly. So a couple of things. I emailed it to you because A, you need to put your last name, first name, okay? Last name, first name, very important because we had a mix up last year and then it delayed your delayed their funding for a long time. Then you have to put in your social security number, okay? So that's important as well. You do not have a Stanford ID, so we have to use something else, which is ends up being your social security number. So please email it to me directly. Do not post this on Google Classroom. That's why I emailed it to you, okay? Um, and then your date of birth, obviously, or not obviously, but that, that's to help with identification. And then where you want the check to be sent. I know we had some mailing mix-ups, so please make sure to send it to wherever um, you want it to be sent. Um, and then ignore this part. We're going to have you mail, the checks are going to be mailed to you, especially because of COVID. This should already have been filled out for you. And then make sure to sign. Um, I, I, I hacked the PDF. I spent like an hour hacking the PDF so you can sign properly. Um, if there are any issues, please let me know, okay? Um, so email that to me. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can print it and then like take a picture, but it's probably better for you to just do it digitally. So you should be able to use, it's, in, it's a PDF, so you should be able to use like the Adobe, the free Adobe software. Um, and yeah, again, don't forget these slides are posted. So if you aren't getting a good sense, you can always refer back to them. Okay, and then another thing I wanted to mention is also the fold scope. So these slides are up online. I think someone also put some information on the fold scope in the chat earlier, um, but they're a really great activity. I won't go into too much detail, but it's really nice to use it as a hands-on activity to then show the students um, a, how to make a microscope, but then B, what does it look like at the nanoscale or actually at the macro or micro scale? Excuse me. So you have that just as an aside. Usually we would have you actually assemble it in the class um, and, and then even go outside and make little samples to play around with. But because for the sake of time, we just can't do that. Um, but there is a video. Oops. There is a video and there are slides. Um, on how to do that. But um, again, I'm going to skip that. But if you want to work on it over the lunch hour and then come talk to me, I again, I'll be online if you want to discuss it. Um, but then other than that, we're going to settle in for a lunch break. But I wanted to set aside some extra time if anyone needed help with their um, stipend form, which is also called the SU21. I don't know why, but that's what it's called. And then also the post survey. We're kind of jumping the gun with the post survey and the stipend stuff, but that's just to make sure, you know, we complete that ahead of time. Okay. So if anyone doesn't have questions, we can um, close out for now. All right. But if you guys, um, other than that, we're okay. So uh, the afternoon again will be, I'll talk briefly about the continuing education credits. 
and then also we'll do the presentations and then that will and then we'll do like a quick little wrap up um and that is it basically <laughs> um But I'll stay on a little longer if anyone needs help. But if you're re if you're ready to go, feel free. To, oops, sorry, feel free to leave. So what we'll do as the last leg um, is we'll share. I know some are some people are groups, which is good. So we'll do group uh, sharing. Like you should all be able to be able to present at this point. I think I've changed the Zoom settings, so you'll be able to present. Um, and then we'll kind of do what we sort of did in our subgroups earlier this morning, um, where we do the presentation and then feedback and then any comments back on the feedback. Does that sound good to everyone or most everyone? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then as we're going along, please make sure to, again, at the end of the day is to make sure you um, send me the SU21 and then the survey. The survey is also um, quite important. Um, for us to sort of make sure we get funded and sort of proof of concept that this this program is working or hopefully working. <laughs> um, oh, and then Dustin had a question. What about the lesson planning reflective guide? So that was just as a guide, but if you want to submit it or submit that as your lesson plan, that's okay too. So we're pretty loose with the, the definition of lesson plan. Um, it can be either the actual NGSS one that we did or the reflective guide. I want to look at the reflective guide because I think that will be helpful for me. So whatever materials you want, um, submit them. And um, actually, you bring up a good point, which is the Google Classroom. So, yeah, we have a few to-dos by the end of this, right? Which one is the SU21, the post survey, and then finally, you will need to submit your presentation or your reflective guide or whatever sorts of documents. Please put your name on the documents also. Um, and they'll be over here where we have the teaching less, the teaching nano. Um, and it'll be um, here, there's a folder. However, right here, if you guys can see, um, please. Put all, oops, please put your name and um, documents into the, into the folder. All right, does that make sense or sound good? Okay, and then if you're having problems with it, obviously I'll be here, so let me know. So, does anyone want to go first, get it over with? Oh, I see Portia raise her hand. Okay, awesome. So, thank you. Are you able yeah. to share your screen? Um, I'm going to try now. OK, let's try. <laughs> so the activity that I decided to use was NanoSend. And it's actually an activity that was in um, the resources folder. So the unit that I would be using this activity in is the structure of matter unit. So the um, the performance activity for this um, part of the unit would be students develop models to explain the structure of atoms and molecules. So the first thing we will be doing is basically um, introducing the students to matter. So what is it? What is it made of? And then they would learn about atoms and the different parts of an atom. And then they would go on to make atomic and molecular models. And then after they do that, they would do the nanosand activity and then after that, they would do the solid, they would start learning about solids, liquid, and gases. And then for the nano sand activity, they have two different kinds of sand, but the students don't know that. So for the first part, they take, um, I guess, a dropper and they squeeze little water droplets on the sand and then for I think one sand, which is a normal sand, it'll just fall into it. And then the other sand, it'll like um, float on top. And I'm more focused on this part to try this part more so than the second part where they're like mixing it with a spoon. So that would be the main thing that I had them do. And then after they do that, they would either write or draw their observations. And in my group, the people I was in a group with, they told me it would probably be better to actually have them give them the, um, 
give them the option to either write or draw because some students don't feel as comfortable writing, but they know sometimes it's easier for them to draw. So I would have them have the option to do both. But this is over here is like an example of what I would have them do. So either write or draw what they saw and then write down their explanation for why the, um, the blue sand did not soak up the water. And then for distance learning, I would just have a video clip of this happening and then they can write down their observations afterwards. So that would be for the first day. And then for the second day, the students would make 3D models of salt and sugar, as well as graphite and diamond. And then afterwards, they would be answering the questions, why sugar is sweet and salt isn't? And then why are graphite and diamonds different from each other, even though they're both made of carbon? So trying to help them get around the idea of um, molecules act differently based on their composition and their structure. And then once again, if I couldn't do this in the classroom, there's a PHET simulation called build a, build a molecule. And so the students um, would build a molecule and they would compare the difference between oxygen and carbon dioxide. And so after the students did that activity, um, they would go back to their answers from the nanosand activity and decide if they want to edit them based on doing their models. And then hopefully they would be able to explain what caused water, water to slide over the nanosand, which would be in the application of structure and how it affects the properties of matter. And I would um, elaborate on that by beginning to talk about nanoscience and saying how nanoscience is where you study materials at the nano level and then see what changes can be made that are gonna affect the properties at the molecular level. And I would use different examples, one of them being like the wax you put on your car, they change it at the nano level to make it where it's hydrophobic, so the water slides off, as well as um, now that we talked about this earlier in the day, I would talk about the invisibility cloak as well and how the um, you're changing the, at the nano level, you're changing things to make it where it reflect, reflects light so things tend to be invisible. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Oops, okay, I found my last again. That was really great. Um, I really like it. Does anyone have any feedback? Obviously, feel free to unmute yourself or any comments. Um, oh, sure. I like oh, oh, Vicky has something. I liked how you, and that just that one part where you made them go back and rethink about their thinking and their initial um, reasoning. And, and you're making them say, oh, wait, wait, I thought this, but now I found out that that it, that it's different and then um, you just have them asking questions later not not always just in the beginning but later i really like those two key components thank you Kim. yeah i really um i like how you tied it all together too you know where there's the hydrophobic hydrophilic and you know you have this phenomenon as well in the beginning and going through and it sounds like it's going to be a series of, of pieces of information so i thought that was really good any other any other comments or questions? So another thing is if you wanted to add or change or um, with the the end part with the the different coatings, you could also include the super hydrophobic coatings if you wanted. That could be another sort of um, add on if you wanted. Um, and I wanted to mention and credit. There's uh, Jenny actually made a whole set of slides for the magic sand, so you could. Um, you know, use those as sort of inspiration or just use them. I think Jenny has given me permission maybe to, you know, adapt them. If you need. Angela owns it all at this point. I mean, not really, but I'm, I mean, Jenny made a bunch of really cool slides. So you may want to take a look at those as well, um, which should be posted um, on the classroom. Yeah, I think I have an article attached as part of the lesson too that would really um, augment what you did, Portia, is having that article to be able to read so the kids can read the scientific principles specific to the, the magic sand too, if that helps. Yeah, I think that would be good. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so round of applause for Portia. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so I, I saw people going volunteering so um i think amrit is next yeah that was this is gonna be hard to follow <laughs> thanks a lot portia <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay. So let me share. Now with this, I was thinking about um, the presentation from yesterday and how he was talking about um, binary code and the phase changes and how you could go from zero to 0 0.5 to one. Um, so I'm worried that some stuff might be a little all over the place, but hopefully you guys will tell me <laughs> if it's crazy. Um, so I wanted to talk about how data is stored. And I was gonna start with the thin films, um, having the kids write their names on the black sheet of paper, just like in a really fun way. Even though the light, um, like looking at the reflection might not have to do with data storage, it would just be like a fun little thing to talk about when we talk about waves later on. Um, and then having them um, take their name to binary code right underneath it. And so like this is before they really know anything about it. Um, and then there's like this little video, I was gonna do this thing, this like quick blurb about um, the difference between analog and digital. Now, this is for steam. They don't know anything, well, not too much about energy yet. So like, it's a very brief introduction to the fact that, you know, energy and the study of it exists, but the type of energy we're going to focus on is over here. Did not, I still working on this part here. Um, so maybe after I show them this, we can talk about why we see different colors if we can see visible light. Like, so where do we lie on the spectrum? And then how are we going to relate that to data storage? Well, there's a whole range that we can't see, right? Um, and there's analog and digital. So um, like the speaker said yesterday, analog is how your brain transmits energy, right? So I was going to have them choose a sense. Um, there's this thing, I went to a conference last year, they did this thing called a tea party. So they, they'd they each get like a three by five card, they'd have to be really, really descriptive, right? And then um, they're not writing their name on their card, but the tea party is basically they take their card, fold it in half, and they have to pass it around as many times as possible in like one or two minutes. So it's a good way for them to kind of get up. Um, and then at the end, like they should never have their hands empty. They should always be passing it around. By the end of it, they're gonna do a group share where they go back to their seats and discuss what's on their card. Was it detailed enough? What would you have changed? So then um, I was gonna do a close read activity. Anna mentioned um, News ELA and there was a really good article on binary code, but then I'm looking more into um, finding an article that talks about analog and binary or analog and digital as a way to kind of segue into binary conversion and digital data, which is where our LCD screens come in. Um, so understanding that, you know, the um, LCD technology, you have these screens that are made up of pixels and each pixel has a specific color that it's coded for. Um, and so then we would practice, okay, so if I give you this chart um, and I said, what is 010 code for? So they would use this and go, okay, zero, go down, one, zero, it would be green. And so then I would give them their, a separate, I'd have to go find, um, I would give them a separate thing where they would all get their own kind of, um, tell me it's on here, like recently. They would get their own um, set of binary. They'd have to figure out what color it is and they're given specific cells. And when they go to like, we're gonna have a communal giant piece of butcher paper, I'll graph it off. And when, if they get it all right, it should be a picture of Waluigi. And just 
show that that's, you know, kind of how LCD technology works um, at the nano level. And that's it. That's all I got. That's really cool. That's a really cool idea. Does anyone have any comments? Questions? Like how you said, that's all I got when it's this huge, huge, like undertaking, beautiful. And yeah, and I got graph paper, so. Oh, nice. Yeah. Come to you. Yes, Waluigi is definitely my favorite um, Super Mario character. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Yeah, I think I, re I really like the visuals. I think, yeah, maybe, I, and I love that you're starting with the thin films as kind of just like a fun thing, but also including the digital stuff um, and then kind of switching over to analog and then switching back to, to digital. I think that's a really nice flip flop. Um, I would say, um, yeah, and if you want, like we could, sh maybe you might want to even share like what the chip looks like you know, when it comes to, or like what inside of a computer, um, I don't know if they do this, um, but I've had some teachers that just ask the kids to like pull apart a computer, that part of it's the fun part, you know, yeah. and say, this is a hardware thing, but it thinks in a digital manner, like, you know, how does that combine? Um, and it, uh, to be honest, that's a hard thing to wrap my, my own brain around. So I applaud you for, for trying to teach it. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Oh, Jenny. Yeah, I was just gonna say that that's, that would, a beautiful segue for your sequence, which is really amazing. You did a great job on that, would be the liquid crystal sheets to bridge between the thin films. And then that certain factors can change the coloration of a thin film. With the liquid crystal digital screen, it's, it's not temperature that's changing it, but the, the thin films, the liquid crystal sheets would be great to be able to see that. Temperature can make it change, but also electrical mm -hmm. current can make it change and other things. You know, a nice segue. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. All right. Um, and then, then, okay, let's look at the list. I think Usha goes next. It's sorry. There we go. Okay. I think now you can hear me. So number one, mine is not as fancy as the first two. So just want to let you know. I just followed the. Okay, the. Come on. So uh, this was like an activity I wanted to do with my six to eight. I, I think basically I'll be teaching grade six through eight next year. That's the plan. So I wanted to do something with the sunscreen and the nano, especially the summer coming. And most of us, my students do use sunscreen once in a while. So I just wanted them to kind of use it a little more. So this is a brief description as it just shows how the sunscreen, how different sunscreens can impact us and which is a because there's lots of sunscreens available in the market, just giving them an idea how to choose the best sunscreen, hopefully. So the idea in the end is one of the learning outcomes would be for the students to understand that sunblocks contain nanoparticles and, and that's how they kind of work. And I don't know how much detail I can go into the working for sunscreen, but just to give them a little feel about it. So the idea before the plan, I'm hoping the students would know the difference between a macro, micro, and a nano particle. At least they know what the word macro means, the word micro means. So hoping I can use those two words and try to define what nano means. And these were this, this, I copied the science practices and the core ideas and the cross-cutting from another activity. I'd seen something similar to this. So I just copied them off. I'm not a science teacher. I'm a math, I've been teaching math for the past two years. So my NGSS information is not very current and not up to date. So the first thing I like to do is I like to show the students a video. I like, normally I do that in the classes. I just give them a short video or short visual and ask them to just give them a few minutes and ask them to write two things they notice and two things they wonder about. So this is a video which talks about everyday nanoparticles and materials which are being used in like most products we see around us. Something similar to what you had shown us in one of these slides before and after they do that I was going to do an activity before I teach them anything I'm just going to give them an activity to go ahead and hey go ahead turn I'm, I think I have a class of about I'm hoping to have a class of 32 so I'm going to divide them into eight groups of four each and each group gets a sunscreen I'll have eight different kinds of sunscreens and 
using the sunscreen, they're going to support, they're supposed to know the brand of the sunscreen and the SPF rating, different SPF ratings, which I could buy from the market. And also make sure that I've got some sunscreens which say they have nanoparticles in them and some which say they don't have nanoparticles, but I wouldn't give this information to my students in advance. And then the next steps, just talk about how to do this experiment or the activity. And it's very similar to what we had done, I think on the second day, I guess, when we did use the sun art paper, very similar to that, just the same procedure. And instead of writing, I'm just gonna be applying sunscreen. And then eventually the students are gonna make some sort of a data table to record their findings. I do not normally give them a set data table. Hey, this is how you record. I just let the kids figure out how they, they want to record the data. And we play around and we see which is the best way to record. So that's another thing I, I just left it blank for the students to figure out. And the idea behind this eventually is that the students are able to demonstrate the relationship between the different sunscreens and the ability to block the sunlight. Which one is more effective and which one is not. And here are some words which it would be nice for the kids to know. And I'm, I was hoping to make a word, word wall display or put it somewhere up on the word, word, like on the whiteboard or maybe on the wall, just what the different words are and how they relate to nanotechnology and nanoscience. So, and I wanted to make sure this nanoscience and nanotechnology are different. So that's one thing I, I would like to clarify to the students during this activity. And eventually, to extend, and I was, I was going to have them kind of figure out that instead of just putting a thin layer of sunscreen, what happens if they put a thick layer of sunscreen, how would it, how would it impact? And I think I was just going to do a little formative assessment, just do a quick check for understanding. Hey, you know, like ask a quick questions or maybe do a brief discussion or maybe have each group present their findings. And my eventually my ideas after they explored and looked at different sunscreens and the effect and the effectiveness is to kind of come make their own sunscreen and just and just kind of present it to the class in an ignite style pitch. I don't know if it, ignite style pitch is one I learned a couple of years ago. It's where you have like about 30, 30, 30 seconds to like a minute and you have 15 slides and you just go fast. So it's all done in a one minute presentation. And um, that's about it. Thank you so much. Yeah, good job. That sounds really fun. I think June may have had a comment. I had a comment. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, there was a study at Stanford that looked at uh, a compound called like oxybenzone uh, in uh, sunscreen, how that affects like oh. waves. Um, oh. So that's something might be very interesting like for your students to read about. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I knew that one of the researchers who, like, it's very interesting, like, because um, it's a biochemical that kind of cycles through even human bodies. Oh. So, like, I think he put it on and then tests his urine, <laughs> like, 24 <laughs> hours later, and there was, pre like, presence of oxybenzone, like, in his urine. So that's... If it were like that. Oh, yeah. That would be a fun fact for the kids to tell, let them know, you know? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Jenny? I, Usha, I think I like it too because you are informing kids and giving the importance of sunscreen. So I think that's good for them because when they go outside in the sun, so they know when to use the sunscreen. So that's very good information for the kids and their parents. I was going to say, Usha, that there are lots of resources online for using UV sensitive beads and testing, yes. testing yeah. sunscreen on UV sensitive beads. That's good, I do have some beats from Steve Spangler, about four years old. Yeah. Maybe I could use yeah. those. And you can, UV sensitive beads, I think, I think you have to order them online. I don't think you can get them at the craft store, but they're not super expensive. Oh yeah, this guy called Steve Spangler. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know his science website. He's, he sells it there. I bought it one year for my kids. Yeah, and then the other thing too is the HHMI, so oh. Howard Hughes Medical Institute has some really great information and research with regard to our skin, the melanin in our skin, and how UV radiation affects that and why we have different skin tones to, um, to protect our skin from that radiation. Yeah, that was another idea of mine, like instead of using it on like the photo of paper, do we have, can we use it on different colored papers and see what happens? Mm -hmm. so just to kind of you know, see how we have different skin tones, maybe different colored papers could would do that. I'm not too sure, just thinking. Mm -hmm. No, I love that idea. Thank you, thank you so much, I got it. 
Thank you. But yeah, with the, the photo paper, I was going to say, and if you wanted to try to make it almost like more reusable, right? Because you can, yeah, so I feel like you can use the transparency, then paint the sunscreen on it even, oh. right? And use the photo paper and see if it would work. I guess it'll work regardless is what actually is what I'm realizing. But depending on the thickness of the sunscreen because some of it obviously if you put the layer on thick enough it will block the light on but if it's thin enough like will it still work because you can okay. see through it visually but maybe it's still blocking the uv light i don't know i've actually never tried this um but this is just a random thought i i had it's good thank you yeah anybody else any other comments or questions Um, and another, you could also play with different types of sunscreen, like spray sunscreen, oil sunscreen. Um, there's a lot of different forms of that sunscreen, obviously, um, or powder sunscreen. Sure, no problem. Anyone else? Anyone have anything to add here? Okay. All right, so we're going to switch over. I think the next person is um, a teaching team this time. I think June and Joanne, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, me and Joanne teach at Oakland Unity Middle School. Um, so this uh, unit is going to be, uh, it, it was originally just a seventh grade led unit uh, since I taught uh, seventh grade last year. Uh, but since uh, because of COVID and like shut down, we actually didn't, never got to this unit. So um, since Joanne's taking over seventh grade and I'm doing eighth grade, um, I'm going to just take this on to eighth grade and Joanne's also going to apply to her seventh graders. So um, kind of just table of content, like what we're gonna go through. So the name of the unit is a mining molecule. So it's a kind of unit solely focused on uh, the water molecule, like how important that is to um, their everyday life and just like the science of inner working of like a uh, water molecule. So um, basically students will conceptualize uh, matter down to the nanoscale. So they learn about atoms, um, compounds, molecules, um, et cetera. And then uh, they, at the end of this, uh, they create like, a solar power water purification device uh, using uh, nanotechnology. Uh, so John, do you want to go over the standards? Yeah, so this middle school NGSS standard is um, earth science and it, um, the standard is to develop a model to describe the cycling of water through the earth systems, through the energy of the sun and gravity. And we wanted to kind of touch on like the engineering process, um, science and engineering process, disciplinary core ideas and cross cutting co concepts. So for the practices, it's like developing a model. And then the core idea is like the role of uh, water in the earth system um, in different environmental like areas um, dealing with like precipitation, condensation, things like that. And then the cross cutting concept is energy and matter within a system. Oh, yeah, and uh, some of the outcomes that students will be learning, uh, just like general the properties of water and the structure of a water molecule. Um, and then uh, they will learn also like in bigger pictures about the water cycle, how precipitation, evaporation, all those uh, phenomena affect their day everyday life. And then at the end of this unit, they will apply their learning. Um, so uh, there's an uh, element of this is like tying in nanoscience. So they'll also apply uh, what they learn from nanoscience to create a model of a uh, nanotechnology. Um, John? So students should come in to this lesson with like a basic knowledge of how water behaves and how it's, it plays a role in their daily lives. And then some things that we were concerned about or like uh, misconceptions that they might have coming into this lesson is not knowing like the metric system or how to read a ruler. And when I was doing the card sort activity, not knowing like what nanometer means or just the um, metric system and just having a hard time. I think I've mentioned this before, just kids visualizing what molecules are or what matter even is. And so trying to teach atoms, molecules, and compounds that are not visible to our students' eyes. And then, our, so for the three E's, um, we're gonna begin with the card sort. I think that was a very good, like, intro into what nanotechnology or nanoscience is and uh, what, like, uh, how small, like, these basic units of matters are. Um, so we'll kind of do something similar, but um, we'll also add in elements that are inherent in, like, uh, 
uh, human wastewater, such as um, uh, hair, viruses, um, toilet paper, or like uh, sand, things like etc. Like that, so that, that they know like the different sizes of different units of uh, these important um, things. And then um, for them to further explore like how nano like particles be, like behave, especially um, the more like water molecules, how they behave amongst each other or with other um, objects. They're so gonna do a quick lab, kind of um, for detail, but like kind of just looking at how um, water holds together or come apart and how um, easily they do that. So kind of learning about adhesion and cohesion. So this is a very quick lab. Um, just involving like just a droplet and students playing around with water droplets on a piece of wax paper. Um, they find this fascinating. Uh, for the first time I did this um, and uh, that was a surprise to me. So like, yeah, that's pretty simple uh, lab for me to like know those concepts. And then... To further their knowledge um, after doing this observational lab, we want to make sure that they're um, reading about what they are they just observed and things like that so we're going to have them do a jigsaw reading and um reading up on surface tension density solid um, of density of solid solid water compared to liquid capillary action and solubility and the article um is going to talk about how water is used in nature like for example this third picture like surface tension um of these bugs and the overall theme is going to be how does water like uh, support life on earth and how jigsaw reading works if you haven't done it before is um, different kids are reading different articles and then you like move them around the classroom so that they they teach each other on what they just read yep and then yeah awesome and then um to, so, mm, sorry go ahead go ahead no you, i think this okay is um to further like build on their learning and what they just read. We're gonna guide them through some guided notes, engaging them on like the water cycle and the water's properties, because they've now observed and they've also read about it, but what does this mean? Um, bigger picture, so we're gonna lead them through some notes. Yeah. And then see, here's some like vocab words. Um, oftentimes we find like Quizlets and like other, like online um, vocab activities are really uh, effective um, for students to learn uh, some vocab words, especially tying to science. Um, and then for students to elaborate and like apply their uh, knowledge, uh, they're basically gonna collaborate and work as engineers to design a uh, solar power device, a desalinization device using what they learn about um, uh, water molecules and all other uh, nanoparticles in their water to create a solar like filtration device that they will test to uh, purify salt water. Uh, and we'll go, as you know, I think this is slightly go more, but basically um, a lot of the supplies you can find in your household and um, you can just like test this out um, in um, like an open space with a lot of sun in your, at your school. So to, for, to evaluate what they learn, their summative assessment is what, just, what June just talked about, which is kind of like their final product is a desalination device. And we're gonna have them reflect on what this means to like, um, how does, what does this mean in the real world? And how can our design like mimic actual nanotechnology used in water purification? And we're gonna have them explain like, it's kind of like the scientific design, um, engineering design process. We're gonna have them reflect um, um, and redesign and, and like how they can improve their model after like reflecting on their final product. Yeah, and then um, just how this ties um, directly to now technology. Um, so we're gonna use a lot of the like activities that we did over um, this uh, session. Like the car store was really helpful for conceptualizing um, matter at the nano scale. Um, so like this can be also tied with like chemistry and like how molecules react um, in different uh, settings. So um, like doing the alpha uh like demonstration, except we're gonna make it alpha rockets to teach them just like general about like um, solubility and chemical reactions. Since a lot of like chemicals are actually dissolved in water. And so like some filters can actually filter now because of the dissolved um, particles. And then um, some self assembly demonstration to just teach about how uh, molecules interact. So, like, kind of magnet thing, 
but just like uh, connecting that to how uh, different molecules react to each other. And then um, there are going to be like some readings and just some uh, videos for students to look at in regards to how nanotechnology currently is being used to develop uh, to purify water. So like with plant uh, purification plants, desalinators, but also like with a uh, life straw or a lifesaver bottle um, and uh, what's called the Selden water safe. Uh, there's some pictures I'll show in a minute, but there are some cool readings that I think uh, Angela like point these out to me. So I'm gonna link them and use them for next year. Um, definitely um, in the past, um, what we did was only doing with salt water, but like I'm thinking like how we can like apply this to like how uh, nanotechnology creates like what's called like nano membranes to filter out um, other pollutants in water. So like maybe sampling that with like a collinger or like a fishing net or like a pool net, that's something like that. And some extra work that I wasn't able to do um, the last time I taught this was um, creating like a salt water circuit to test the effectiveness of like desalinization. Um, so it's pretty easy to make, but I, I think that week I just ran out of time and didn't have time to do it. But um, it's uh, kind of just connected to like a battery and a light bulb and you could like test the presence of salt in water. But yeah, um, here's some examples of how nanotechnology is being used currently like for water purification. So we got here the shell Selden. Seldom water stick. Um, it uses um, actual carbon um, nanotubes to filter out uh, things down to the level, like the size of a virus, even like dissolve like molecules within um, water. So only allowing water to pass through. And then there's something called the uh, uh, water purifier, uh, the lifesaver bottle. Um, so it uses nano membrane uh, that only filters out like uh, it keeps everything that's larger than like 15 nanometers. Um, out so like only like basically only water will pass through and then there's also the life straw which is um, more um i think commonly known um and that also filter out like a lot of different like part particulates um and uh, i think this one's a i think it's, it doesn't do a better job than this one but I also use the same technology the nano membranes yeah here are, we just wanted to list a list of materials that are gonna be used in this particular unit. And they're very like, um, we try to keep it to like household items so that maybe if it is only distance learning that it could be easily accessible. Yeah, and so, and yeah, definitely. And then, um, so this is some pro uh, like final products in our past, but, um, so like these are some uh, examples. Like I feel um, the students really like uh, enjoy like designing it, um, and also getting pretty messy with the salt in the water. Um, and then uh, I believe we left these out for just like um, two or three days, like so just half a week. And then at the end of the week, we uh, test the results, see if um, they actually their device actually worked. And it was a pretty crude method. I think it was literally just us asking the students to taste. Um, the water that was like evaporated and filtered out if it tasted salty or not. Um, so uh, definitely like the actual work of creating that wa uh, the water circuit, uh, salt water mm -hmm. circuit might help. Yeah. So we wanted to end with like a distance learning lens because no one knows what fall school is going to look like in the fall. So we kind of said like demonstrations on Zoom, like Angela was, uh, she had her camera down to her desk and she was able to show us like what she was doing. So demonstrations and creating supplies and packets for students to take home. So this year we had students when distance learning first began come pick up packets and Chromebooks from our school. So just having those ready for them so that we don't have to like ship out like so like so many boxes and finding at home experiments that could be done with everyday household items for our students and then finding solution uh, simulations online i think um, the first presenter mentioned like a fet like a molecule building one that i we could definitely do and so these are some of the things that we could transition to if we were going fully online again in the fall yeah um, so any questions? I, I have two questions. Yeah. 
Um, so my first one I had already pre-typed up, so I'll, I'll delete it after I say it. Um, your cards at the very beginning, it looked like new pictures. Did you come up with your own pictures or were those just Angela's cards? No, those are um, ones I found a lot. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. I thought, wow, that's a lot of work. You got to do good. <laughs> and then the you next thing you. is the um, idea of having to find um, activities that we could do um, online with our kids through Zoom. I think uh, we should probably share that. Like as a group, we should come up with it together because we're all doing this. Might as well just put it on that sheet that Angela shared with us. So that way we can all have that. And I do have one more suggestion for, because both of you are at the same school for seven. One of you maybe um, does the salt water one. And then for eight, do the dirty water one. So that's what I do for my school. And it is a real competition. I don't know if you guys have heard of Mesa, but they actually have to come up with a design and then go and compete at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So, and it uses all your uh, materials too. Oh, Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's a really fun idea. Thanks, Samantha. What is the organization called? You say, oh, yeah, MESA. MESA, Mathematics, yeah. Engineering, and Science Achievement. MESA. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm MESA lesson plans are free, so you can just look for it. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to add something. So I, you, when you were talking about the water, I would say even talk about like hydrophilic and hydrophobic stuff, yeah. right? As part of as a vocab word, but also just as a property. Um, and then what is really good also, um, I, I wasn't sure, like all, I didn't see all the materials, but a glass slide or just like a piece of glass is really good because it really, the water really likes to stick to glass. Mm -hmm. Um. But then sometimes if you coated it with something, then, you know, it will change to like going back. You can also do the super hydrophobic one. I'm not trying to sell this activity to you at all, but I'm just saying it's a nice um, combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, oh, Jenny, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say when you were talking about the water droplets on the wax paper, a good comparison substance would be rubbing alcohol. Is, is seeing how the rubbing alcohol doesn't bead like the water beads. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of density with, you know, if, if you were comparing, if you really wanted to look at the, the special properties about water, mm -hmm. that would be a good comparison substance. The adhesion is different. Um, the density is different if you dropped an ice cube in it compared to in regular water. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing was, I, I don't know if this would be relevant for your particular sequence, which is really outstanding, or if anyone else wanted to use it, but there's a really simple way of splitting water molecules, where you just take a plastic cup and through the bottom uh, surface of the plastic cup, punch through metal, um, two metal uh, thumbtacks, fill it with water, and then take a nine volt battery and let it touch the bottom of those two thumbtacks. And it literally splits the water inside the cup. It's not dangerous, super simple, doesn't cost a lot. Um, and you can actually see the bubbles go up from those two thumbtacks, depending on which, uh, which um, whatever those things are called on the top of a battery. You can actually see a difference in bubbles for the, the ratio of the H2O, how many bubbles are coming up from each of those little, uh, what do you call those things? Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Is, is there like a name for that lab that I can like Google? I'm trying to find it for you. <laughs> I actually have one in my files. I, I actually found it. I scoured the internet for like hours until I found, because I was trying to, it's called electrolysis. Yeah. I have the word for it, electrolysis, splitting water. And I finally found this little, you know, some person was doing it in their basement or whatever, just doing this little thing with a plastic cup and two thumbtacks and a battery on the bottom. I, I can send you a copy of that. I'll just have to look through my files. Yes, please. Well, do you, um, just a quick question. How do you think in like our our lesson sequence, where would that go best? I don't know if that specifically, I think the rubbing alcohol would fit really, really well, especially like I say, comparing how it beads on wax paper and the density and the adhesion properties and all those other things. Mm -hmm. um, in your specific sequence, I don't know. If you wanted to get into the molecule as you know, particles of oxygen and hydrogen, and I don't know how you were going to um, connect it with you know, the ecosystem, but the oxygen and hydrogen, you can literally split the water and the kids can see this liquid 
water split into two different gases. And like I say, you can literally see that there are more bubbles coming from one of the, Angela, do you know what those things are called on the top of a battery? The electrodes? I, I don't know, whatever those the things are. The, well, there's the anode and the cathode. There you go, the anode and the cathode. One, one is emitting twice as many bubbles as the other. So you yeah. can literally ask the kids which one is oxygen and which one is hydrogen. Yeah. H2O. It's super yes. simple. Stoichiometric. Yeah. I would even say in the beginning, you could even use that as an introductory, say, what is water, what is water made out of, right? Um, right, because it's made out of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas um, mm -hmm. and all the properties. Like water is a really unique material by itself, right? It has all the hydrogen bonding. That's why it has that skin on the water. And what happens if you change the properties or like add things to water, it kind of changes it. It will, if you, if you add a lot of salt, it will kind of change the water's properties. If it like adhe it, it, um, adheres to water, I mean not water, adheres to um, glass and things like that, it changes it a little bit. So, um, yeah. but, I, but um, a bunch of people went, went a Googling for you on your behalf. So in the chat, I think there's a few um, links. I don't know if you're able to click on them but um, there's yeah. also, you can, you can click on them. Uh. Maybe, okay, you can double click or sometimes if I right mouse click, it will say then open URL. Anyway, okay. All right, very good job. Thank you, it's very thorough. Speaking of water, the question you know, the student sometimes has a silly they ask me questions said, Mr. Shai, is water wet? Is, is it wet? <laughs> I don't know what how to answer that question. Did any any of your students ever ask that? Is water wet? How do you answer that question? It's not. <laughs> I just it's don't. a meme. It's uh, like from a. Isn't it from like a video or something like? It's a, from a video, yeah. It's been around for two years, like I went to this. Uh, I think I, I heard this like person like who studies, actually does study water to talk about that. Um, and what she said was no, except um, so like water, like water molecule, so like for it to be wet, it needs to be in contact with water and water is like itself. So like you could say that each individual water molecule is wet because it's in contact with another water molecule. It's very hard to explain. <laughs> oh, I, okay. It's very, it's a very meta explanation. Exactly. Okay. It's like water, like wet means like in contact with water. So like. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of hard to explain. Water I think the kids just say it to rile us up. <laughs> That's really funny. Okay. Uh, let me, I'm going to copy, I'm going to try to copy all this over so I can save it for you, but we'll see. Okay. Do you want us to go next while you're copying? Yeah. Why don't you okay. guys go? It's all right. Samantha and Fiaz, right? I'm going to mute myself. Is Samantha, is that your screen or my screen? It's mine. Okay. You can start talking if you want. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was going to start with a picture, a photo. But I guess I probably can. We can share at the same time. No, no, I'll, I'll stop. I'm sorry. We see you. Oh, you don't see my screen? Okay, I click on share, but. Okay. Oh, you can see my screen? Mm-hmm. Now, can you see the what I'm sharing right now? Yeah, we can see the crying baby. Okay, in the baby in the incubator. Okay. Yes. So um, I teach science, like I teach life science, chemistry, and earth science, and Samantha, she teaches the STEM classes. We were thinking about our lesson plan that we could both use it using the nano science. So we came up with this. This is kind of project for our kids. Let's say on Samantha's class, kids, they, they make things and it's very exciting. I, when I, anytime I go by, I see the kids are involved. So in this project, we are giving the student, um, telling them to make an incubator. So they make, they're, they're going to design incubator. 
but in the incubator you guys are looking at it is probably cost several thousand dollars. So the, the kid's job is to come up with an incubator, which is like less you know expensive, and we want to extend that to you know part of the world where people cannot afford these expensive. So and then it's portable, it's easy to use, and, and easy to use the energy. Like if there are places where there is no electricity, how are people going to use uh, those incubators? Then we explain to the kids, why do we need incubators? Why do we have to place the kids in the incubators? So then we explain to them that, okay, well, when the kids are prematurely born, they don't have enough fats and between the muscles and their skin, so they cannot hold the heat. And if they can hold the heat, then, you know, they can, they can say, or, you know, even something else can happen. So, so we need an incubator that is accessible to all less expensive, we give them the criteria and say, okay, we need, you guys need to make an insulator, an incubator using available material. And then and then how are we gonna warm up? Okay, there are places in the world that they don't have electric, electricity. So how are they gonna heat up? So then they science and where they see how salt and acetate, when they combine and heat it up, they can, generate heat and then could be reused over and over. So with that, we go ahead and give that project to them. Now, Samantha can go ahead and now can explain that. I mean, we're using, uh, Angela, we're using your format. We were gonna put it in our PowerPoint, but we thought that was just easy and as you're giving us only five minutes for a presentation. So we're using your format. So Samantha, you can go ahead. Can you guys hear me? I've got two screens going on here. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. So um, I did the typing with using Mr. Shaw's brain. <laughs> so he has access to the Amplified curriculum and I still don't. Um, and we wanted to make this so it's useful for everybody in our group to just be able to take our unit and teach it, you know, so you're not having to search for anything. We're just trying to make it easy for you guys. So. Um, if you like this, don't take it yet. Wait till it's like fully complete. Like I have notes on here to help me, um, re remind me what I need to do and notes for you too, so that you're not giving kids the answer key. But this is just the basic stuff. It's straight from the curriculum. The standards are all there. Um, so the engaging, we also wanted to use the cards and just like, I think somebody said, start out with a few cards. And if this was, um, doing it at home, totally fine. Have the kids come pick it up and they can lay it all out. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, if you were to do it in the classroom, they could do it in a group. And those questions that we want to start, um, stimulating their thinking or their interest. Uh, we just came up with some uh, three easy questions to have them start thinking. Um, I really like your slides today. Um, was it today? The consumer applications, I think it was today. But um, I plan on putting that into uh, the lesson plan somewhere so that way it's easier to teach. Um, we really loved your video, the six uh, uh, small videos um, in the explore section, uh, break them up into groups and then have them fill out the diamond organizer because we really like that too. Um, in the explain part for the kids to explain their thinking, we wanted them to use Padlet. Um, if you're into Flipgrid, of course, your kids can video themselves and put it on there too. My kids are not into video um, taping themselves, although I'm sure they do all that crazy social media stuff. But when it comes to actual learning stuff, they don't want their faces on there. So Padlet has worked really well for me. Um, Mr. Shaw gave me this video about the sodium acetate. So I figure, you know, you can click on that too. And then our vocabulary words, they're all there. Um, we also wanted to, uh, for this one, schedule that online field trip for that basement person. I can't, I couldn't remember his name, but um, that would fit in right there for the Marcin, explanation. Marcin with the, with the, he had a mask on and with the, the butterfly wing. Yeah, but okay. I remember you calling him like you're in the basement, right? That's <laughs> why I remember that one. <laughs> uh, but of course, all all of the um, field trips are good. But just for this specific one, 
for them to see that, um, to, to go with the vocabulary words. And then um, to add some math into this STEM class, right? To elaborate uh, on scientific notation, there's a video there. And then of course, there's a worksheet. Um, as a teacher, you're gonna have to copy that and just the two first pages because page three and four has the answer key. So just wanted to remind you, do not send out the whole thing. And then as a culmination at the end, they are going to make that um, incubator that Mr. Shaw was talking about and looking at the three factors of price, uh, temperature, and then the source of energy we're already giving them. But of course, they'll probably have to figure out how much of the sodium acetate they're going to use and how long it will last. So that is the project. And then if you go to the very last page, um, this stuff right here is stuff from the book that they're saying, this is what you need. I mean, that's for if you're in the classroom, but if you're not there, you're not going to use it. And um, same thing with, uh, I think Joanne said she would make packets for the kids. That's the exact same thing we would do. Just provide it. And of course, if you can find more stuff around the house, you can. I think that's it. Any Mr. Questions? Shaw, anything else? Uh, that said, you explained it really well. Um, any questions? I know we were looking at our time. You said only we have five minutes. So, so we looked at that and said, okay, we want to keep it short. So if there's any questions, that was really interesting. So, so as part of the Amplify Science, they have the kids make a incubator. Well, we, I mean, practically is not going to be possible in my classroom, but in Samantha's classroom, yeah, it's possible because uh, you know that's the standard. She has all the material, and I don't, you know, so I can't do that. And plus, I have hundred fifty students, and she does too, but she has all the materials, and I don't, yeah. Well, I also have but the, the kids, time you know, because that, that's because the whole point. So like his class, he has to go by the curriculum, the pacing, and then my class, yeah, it's yeah. whatever you want to do, Samantha, you know, just keep the kids busy. So <laughs> that's what I do. We're just making stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and I was going to say, the maybe somewhere, I remember at the end, you were in the engage maybe part or explore part. You could even um, add in the, the card sorting, um, the card sorting activity. I thought that might be nice for the size and scale of objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be um, another additional sort of add on. Um, and then, yeah, any other comments or questions for Fiaz and Samantha? Oh, Jenny has something. Yeah, you can tell me to be quiet if I get tiresome. But I was just thinking in terms of the incubator, um, sometimes they use different wavelengths of light, for example, for jaundice. Mm. And that would be a nice tie-in with the electromagnetic spectrum and, and maybe light nano, you know, nano scale. Yeah, I don't know if you have Jenny, I'm sorry, I think my internet connection is not that good. I missed what you just said. Oh, I just said sometimes um, the babies are put in in the incubator. Or I don't I don't know the medical term for those, if it's a simple incubator or a different kind of incubator, but sometimes they have to address issues of jaundice. And so they use different light waves, I was saying. And so using, just tying in the lightweight aspect of it. So. But, but this design is like pretty simple. What, how to just uh, you know provide the heat to the premature baby so they don't lose too much of their body heat. Mm -hmm. That's infrared. That's also on the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it looks like Anna is going to be using Amplify next year. Mm -hmm. I hope you like it. Yeah, I don't have access to it either yet, but <laughs> it seems like it would it would work well, especially if we keep doing distance learning. Yeah, I think Amplified yeah, I is think good. So. Amplified is good. Well, oh, Fias, you might have frozen. Distance learning gonna last, but it's good because. You, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I have a bad internet connection. Maybe maybe turn off your video if that's okay. 
Sometimes yeah. that helps. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. No, I think I, I just have a bad connection. Yeah, it's cutting you off. Yeah. I'm sorry, I bad connections. No worries. We can hear you a little better if you wanted to talk a little okay. bit about the Amplify Science a little more. Speaking of Amplify and uh, other digital curriculum, I, you know, honestly, I, I found it more beneficial during the uh, school closure and the dis for distance learning. Now, the one I we use Amplify, it's, uh, you know, you can give assignment to students. Um, they can use it anywhere in the world as long as they have computer and internet and they can complete assignment. You can give them feedbacks. The only thing that I was telling you the other day that missing was how to explain the hands-on activity. And now they're making videos of that. So now at least the kids can see what they want or want them to do it. So that's a good thing about it. So yeah, for distance learning, uh, Amplify and any other digital um, curriculum is good. Thank you, Fiaz, and thank you, Samantha. All right, so I see, yeah, a list is piling up. Thank you, Karithika, for, for taking for taking role. <laughs> so we have um, Juliet next. Are you ready to go, Julia? Yep, okay, perfect. All right, so um, what I did for my plan is I try to uh, incorporate some activities into my medical detectives class, which is a project lead the way elective, which is taught to seventh and eighth graders. Um, so I've been teaching this class the last couple of years, but last year they changed the curriculum. Um, so, it's kind of, and I didn't get to teach the whole thing because we went into lockdown or shutdown. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it goes on next year. But basically the class, they, they play the role of real life medical detectives and they actually use data and, and experiments to diagnose diseases. Um, and so they're really looking at different types of diseases, different um, viruses and bacteria, and see how it affects people and try to look at um, data to figure out what diseases the, the people or the, the patients have. So I thought this would be really good um, since nanoscience is a big part of medicine, you know, and they need to be exposed to it. So um, the first part of the class is where they are introduced to vital signs and how to take vital signs on each other and everything to see what, what is normal. Um, and then they actually go into the different types of diseases and they focus a lot on viruses and bacteria. So I thought this would be a really good opportunity to do the how big is it um, activity so they can actually see the scale and the size of these viruses and bacteria because they have a hard time imagining um, how small it is. So I think by doing that activity, um, they can actually realize how small scale that is. And also in their curriculum, they also show tons of pictures of the viruses and bacteria. And they always wonder, well, how do they get those pictures? You know, how we can't see them. How do they get the pictures? So I was thinking um, of introducing the um, scanning probe microscope activity with the magnets so that I could explain the difference between light microscopes and electron microscopes and atomic force microscopes and how they come up with those images um, so that they know where they're coming from. Um, so once they do that, then they actually get into diagnosing some diseases um, and they kind of get vital signs and, and um, in symptoms and they try to diagnose that. So um, the other part of the class that I thought I could use some things um, is in the second part of the class, they learn about the nervous system and how signals are sent throughout the body and about the brain. And then they actually have to um, diagnose um, some people um, based on um, dissection of the brain. And so they get case studies and some of the brains have actual um, tumors and cancer tumors. So then once they diagnose them, um, after they diagnose them, um, we could actually talk about how to treat cancer. And we could talk about the nanoscience involved and how smaller particles are actually more effective in treating um, certain disease or certain, you know, medicines. So we could do the Alka-Seltzer activity to explain that so they could visualize that. And then also talk about how the um, 
sweet self-assembly and how that could be used in the future to target specific cell areas. Um, Cause they always wonder about how to treat cancer and how to, how do we treat all this stuff once they figure it out? So um, I think that's about it. I mean, there's other stuff that goes on in the class, but I thought these were the two areas that I can incorporate those activities the most. Yeah, that was great. Thank you for sharing. I really, I really like that fun action. So the kids actually dissect brains, like actual brains. Yeah, they're sheep brains, but they, they, they're a person. They're a case. So the the case comes with symptoms, and then they get to diagnose it. And each one, each brain has something different wrong with it. So I kind of have to match up the brain to the symptoms and and stuff like that. So that's crazy. Um. Um, a question what is the name of the curriculum you use for the medical oh, it's a it's a part of the project lead the way class curriculum so it's a thing you have to be trained in so it's a, a basically a stem class um and so in our school we do three classes we do um what do we do we do the computer robotics and we do medical detectives and green energy. So there's different classes you can do, but you have to be like, you have to send people to training and get verified as a school, as a Project Lead the Way school. And Julia, would you say it's a very expensive program? Um, you buy kits from them for the year. Um, and I believe the kits are maybe about $1,000 per class but that's for a semester and then you have to get trained in it. But once you're trained, you're, you know, you don't have to go back to training. So it depends if the, and you can get, well, our school got grants for it is how we pay for it. So. Yeah. They were our competitors. Um, when I worked at the other nonprofit, <laughs> they're really <laughs> they're very good at um, their job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one thing I thought that might be a helpful um, tie in is the coronavirus video that I, added um the vox one there's a one that um it's a pretty short video it's like five minutes but it is cool because they talk about how they image the coronavirus using the scanning electron microscope so okay, cool. i thought that might be a nice little extend maybe for um for your students uh, yeah that, that would be perfect yeah thank yeah. you i like the way you built it up any any other questions or comments jenny I was just going to ask if you talk about MRIs or use MRI images at all. Um, I haven't just because it's not really in the curriculum, but I could, you know, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, but I love that. I didn't know you guys could do that. That's, school is very different from when, when I was a kid. Okay. Um, all right. Anything else? Any other additions? Okay. All right. Well, like. Thank you, Julia. Um, and then we've got Vicky coming up. Or is it Vicky? Are you with a t someone else? Okay, no, you're by yourself. No, um, Amber and I were going, but then we um, we broke out <laughs> from each other because um, so I'm teaching math this year mostly, oh, okay. and hopefully STEAM. So I went. I keep doing that. So I went um, in the math direction, and I decided to just focus on scale. Okay. Oh wait, before you start though, I remember I saw somewhere in the chat Leo had mentioned your your flow flow vocabulary. Flock, flo I don't know what the word is. Vocabulary. Uh, um, there's a link in here. I'll show it to you. It's a. Oh, okay, link. perfect. Then I will shut up. So um, my standards have to do with math and science because really my love is in science. And but I'm going to start. So I want to hit the ground like day one, day two with a lesson ready, and I'm I'm coming in with a teaching seventh and eighth grade. So this is gonna go for both grades. So um, students will be able to identify and compare parts of the metric system. And I always just start off like there's two measurement systems and I explain what they are and all the names for imperial system, there's a ton of them. And then um, share your prior knowledge on this Padlet. So um, somebody else was talking about Padlet. I also like to use it. Kids just come right here. They put their prior knowledge with, what do they think is a metric unit compared to an imperial unit like kilograms or cups. And then um, our focus will be on the metric system. So then I'm gonna ask them to figure out what their own meter is. Like I know for myself, the length from my foot to my hip 
is one meter. So they have to figure that part out. My centimeter, my millimeter. So then they can always have something to refer to. And then um, I'm gonna use the, the how big is it um, activity that you gave us. And I, I have a couple of videos on just reading exponents in the power of 10. Uh, that's something that I had to hit on pretty hard in science this year. They're like, what? What's an exponent? And then um, I have a couple of metric system videos. One is just brain pop. But if you want to see vocabulary, this is it. We have a subscription to it. And this is probably my favorite video. I'm just going to play like a minute of it. You know, I figured out how to memorize the metric system. It's all based on powers of 10. So you just need to memorize a couple Latin prefixes, and then you can measure anything. Just remember King Henry. Oh, you don't know about King Henry? Listen up. King Henry died drinking chocolate milk. King Henry died drinking chocolate milk. King Henry dies drinking chocolate milk. King Henry dies drinking chocolate milk. It goes kilo, hecto, deca, deci, centi, milli, we, kilo. So that's like a song I would play all year, once a week in the morning as they're walking in so that they don't forget. It's one of those spiral. Um, but let me just show you real quick. There's all sorts of stuff in vocabulary. And they're all like rap videos and my kids, they love them. Right, Amrit? They're, yeah, they're attached to them. So um, uh, then I would actually talk about um, what meters, grams, and liters are. And um, from experience from the last couple of years, they're like, what? Don't know what a meter is. Don't know what a gram. Don't know what a liter. Um, so then we do, we have some task card practice. They're just these little I was trying to come up with activities that we could do online and in the classroom. And so, um, honestly, I got this one off of Teachers Pay Teachers. And they're just little task cards, they say, which would be better to measure in liters or meters or grams. And then um, I, st I stay here a little while and talk about what the symbols are for a K means kilo. And then they always get stuck knowing kilometer, kilo liter, kilogram. So we're gonna stick here for a minute. So like on this whole section, I'm, I'm on the above zero. But then I thought my next like little tie-in would be how big is a nano? So then I'm gonna get to the below zero. So that, I guess the whole, um, it was all kind of prior knowledge, activating it, seeing what they know. So then I would start getting into thin film name tags just because it's just a, what happened? What do you think happened? How can color relate to size? And then starting to talk about how big is a nano. Uh, I, I like to do a couple of those videos and the diagram. And um, I like that somebody was saying that they were going to pull those consumer applications. It was a Fiazza's team and Samantha, I think. And I, I, so I went and I said, you know what? I need to put that in because I love that part. And then I thought I would talk a little bit more about nano, like using a soap video and the coronavirus would be perfect. I like to do the floating self-assembly. And then I love to do the lab field trip more so they can see what a nano, the moving the microscope, that my kids would love that. And then um, did I already do this part? Read one of these articles. Did I do this one twice? No, let me go back. Oh no, I didn't. This is the article. There's one in English, one in Spanish because my population is very mixed. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of MindMeister, but I'm gonna go to it so you can see what it looks like. And it's mind mapping software. It's free, very easy to use, but it maps um, data for you just by pressing like, if I click right here and I press tab, or if I press, uh, I'll press tab and I enter something, then I press enter, it'll give me another. So I'm gonna get out of there. That's how they're gonna, um, so I like it, I have so much, um, more information I'll put in here. But then uh, since I'm a math teacher, I thought then I want to go into surface area. Or when I hit surface area, this is where I'm going to go. I want to start with the Alka-Seltzer activity because that blew my mind. And then I'll start off with this picture. And then I have an activity link on uh, nanotech education. I found this book, Spaghetti and Meatballs. I don't know what happened to my picture. Oh, man, I lost it. Oh, but there's the book, Spaghetti and Meatballs for All. And it gives an activity of um, surface area of tables. And 
uh, Amrit found this for me. It's just really cool pictures. I love this picture right here that shows that your volume doesn't change just because your surface area changes. And I la la this is still definitely a work in progress. I'm going to figure out um, how it connects exactly to my new curriculum, but that's kind of where I am so far. That's it. Quick and dirty. That was great. That was really fun. Thank you for sharing the um, full vocabulary. That was so, so fun. I think I would remember things way better with that music. That's definitely the way that I like to teach because that's the way I learn. So, Yeah. And the Mind Meister was really cool. Um, those are really awesome. Mm. Does anyone have any comments or um, questions for, for Ricky? You guys are done, huh? Keep going. Oh, yeah. And the meter on me, Amrit is writing, um, meter on me, centimeter on me. I really like that, too. Um, I don't know if Amrit meant to do a pun, but like meter stick, it will really stick. <laughs> she says no. Okay. Um, and the like meter long chocolate bar I thought was cool. Um, yeah. I think, Vicky, oops, what, Vicky, one thing that might be interesting is to ask your kids if you are ending up to be remote, you're going to ask your kids to like find a liquid, find a powder and like find like something hard to bring and then play around with the, oh, should I measure this as a volume or as a weight or like a measurement? Yeah. It's like the task cards, but to do it hands-on. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. That could be fun. That'd be um, way fun. Yeah. Get your dog. How would you measure this dog? <laughs> yeah. right? Get your sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good idea. Sure. Anything else? Anything to add to uh, Vicky's? Okay. Oh, Thank Jenny. You. Miss Jenny. Well, you could call on me every time if you want to. Okay, okay. I will. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, the videos that they have on YouTube, like Powers of 10, which yeah. Angela, you're familiar with. You've posted that before where you, you know, start off super, super small and zoom out and zoom out and zoom out and zoom out. So you're starting for like nanoparticles all the way to the entire, I don't know, what's the biggest, the universe? I think there's more than the universe. I just forget what The observable universe thing is as big as it gets. Hey, what's the name of that software? It's not, um, it, it, I forgot, I used to, Prezi, it's Prezi software. Have you guys used that software before? That's what it is. It's a Prezi. A long time ago, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you. Good idea. I'm going to put that in there. At least for them to play with, huh? More than anything. Well, no, actually, it's a video where it goes by powers of 10. But I bet you they'll have access to it somewhere. Because I l would like to control it. Because I'm controlling like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, the powers of 10 video. You know, yeah. I already forgot about it. But yeah, yeah there's the, the one that Dustin mentioned that I think I showed you earlier, which was the um, scale of the universe one which yeah it lets you control and click through but then this is the other video um the powers of 10 i think this is it's a little um dated but it's still good oops um i won't play it for you but i'll put it in the chat okay and dustin just sent me one too so yeah <laughs> the first comment it says, "I bet the classroom was mesmerized and scared at the same time." Okay, anyway, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Thanks, guys. Okay. Oh, Karithika says my students were okay, <laughs> so it is dated, but I'll add it. I for, I think I thought I had added it, but maybe I didn't. Anyway, okay, so I'll do that. Um, anything else? Anyone else? All right, claps all around. Okay, uh, Miss Anna is up. Okay, let me share my screen. My lesson is definitely a rough idea at this point. So very open to ideas um, or other connections, but, um, oh wait, I'm trying to share. Can you share? I'm just making sure. Hold on, I might need to change one thing because I recently got a new computer. So I think it's, Oh no, I just need to change my security settings. No worries, take your time. Um, okay. Do a quick stretch break actually. Yeah, perfect. Why don't we Definitely. do that? Yeah. Um, I might actually need to quit out of Zoom and then re-enter. Okay, so. that's fine. Okay, okay. so we'll, yeah, we'll check back in basically like a minute. Everyone stretch. Okay. I love that. No problem.
So my idea is kind of to introduce nanoscience around the, with snowflakes being the phenomenon. Um, I, like I said, we're using Amplify next year at my school and I don't have full access, but I know that there is a phase change unit. And this past year when I taught phase change, it was focused around water. Um, so this would be kind of fit in um, after they've already learned about the structure of water molecules. So there was a, um, while I was looking at resources, there was a um, NIS net lesson that was sort of also focused around snowflakes. So I used some of the ideas from that. I, I think it was more for like a museum setting, um, but it had some good background info. I'm still definitely like wrapping my head around the, the levels and the ways that nanoscience connects to snowflakes. Um, but I think this is kind of just a start in terms of how I would want to um, center this lesson around snowflakes. So the big idea being that snowflakes have a complex structure that depends on the nanoscale arrangement of water molecules in an ice crystal and the environment in which they form. So it's one of those phenomena where you can observe visually with our eyes how the um, nanoparticles that we can't see are arranged. Um, so like I said, it would be in the phase change unit, which includes atoms, molecules, matter, phase change, energy, and natural resources. And that middle school NGSS standard is around using models and developing models to describe atomic composition of molecules and extended structure. So this would be um, an extended structure. And students would start by just asking questions about snowflake formation, learn a little background about um, nanoscience is, and then the ultimate goal being understanding snowflakes as an example of self-assembly in nature. So some prior knowledge that they would have at this point in the unit is knowing that all matter is made of atoms. And this, these slides aren't wouldn't be what I would show in the class, but more just like how I started to think about the lesson and more just for this group. Um, that atoms can combine to make molecules. They would, we last year did like a candy model with gumdrops of water molecules. So I would probably still do that um, to introduce hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. And then we got into the crystal lattice structure of ice. So. What was cool, because I didn't actually realize this, um, I mean, I did, but I didn't see the connection with snowflakes. You can already see in the crystal lattice the hexagonal arrangement of the water molecules, which is exactly why the snowflakes have six sides. So they would have already seen this, and then hopefully this would kind of make that connection. Um, one misconception that I came across, although this is kind of debatable, everybody's heard that no two snowflakes are the same. Um, it's so that there's some common structures and it's all dependent on the conditions under which they form. But apparently there have been a couple scientists who have claimed to find the exact same structure. So this one's kind of up for debate, but could just come up as a question of what do you think and why or why not? Um, something that I did last year, and this was part of the um, Stanford scale curriculum that I used last year is beginning units with a concept map. So having the phenomenon at the center and then as a group, they work to create a map with questions around the outside in circles and any potential answers then stem off from the circles, but in boxes. And this, they get so much better at it over time. And I was just thinking, um, Victoria shared Mind Meister, and I'm thinking that this could be done even virtually, which I hadn't really thought of before, but this was a great tool for just accessing prior knowledge. So start with that around snowflakes or just snow in general. And then some background is what, what you need to form snowflakes, water, then temperature, and a nucleator. So that's like a, usually a piece of dust for the crystal to form around and then introducing how snowflakes connect to nanoscience. So some of the definitions of nanometer, um, put 
you know, water molecules into that context. And then that the structure of snowflakes that we see reflects that nano arrangement of the water molecules. And then the explorer, I was thinking stations um, and using the, the magnet self-assembly and the Lego self-assembly among maybe like tactile models and um, potentially some, if anybody has ideas too of other activities that could be part of the stations. Um, in our small group, I, we were talking about how with the, the Lego self-assembly could be a really great one because we saw, a lot of us saw that we actually didn't get the same exact shape every time. It was like the general, generally the shape was the same, but sometimes it, the magnet attached at different angles. So that's kind of, an, uh, could be a cool model for the variations in snowflakes, even though they have the same basic shape. So that would be the explore. And I think the magnet self-assembly is just great at showing like the crystal lattice, um, kind of how the polarity affects arrangement of water molecules. And then we would get into self-assembly as the explanation um, and connect back to that hexagonal structure and talk about how shape is determined by the molecular structure. That's kind of, I think, the, the key takeaway. And then, um, we were also talking in our small group about News LA. If anybody has used that, it's a great um, resource that takes news articles um, and it, it's constantly updated and it um, creates alternative versions in different reading levels and also versions in Sp Spanish and you can actually assign them individually. So that's been a great tool during distance learning too for being able to differentiate some of the reading. And then just some more elaboration in terms of connecting it to how nanoscientists actually study snowflakes. So these are some electron scanning uh, microscope images of snowflakes. And then just talking about some of the other applications of um, self-assembly in terms of materials and technologies that are created. For the evaluation, I think it would depend for this, oops, I, I used a different um, phenomenon, but I think it would depend for this one how long this like lesson spanned in terms of whether I would want them to just return to the same concept map and add answers or like, actually model snowflakes. I think that could be another way of assessing would be to have them work on group or individual models of how snowflakes actually form. So I think that's it. Yeah, so those are my ideas so far, but like I said, kind of um, just a rough idea. So definitely open to other ideas or connections or activities to tie in. Anna, have you thought about biomimicry? Oh, we talked about that. Ooh. Yeah, we talked about that, but I, yeah, that would be cool. I'll send you a link that. Okay. But if you just type in um, biomimicry and snowflakes, there's a ton of stuff on. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Presentation, everything. Jowled great, huh? I think that'll be really cool. I have a question, though. Do you think your kids will have a hard time? Like imagining snow, because they'll all be from LA. I know. That was something that I was thinking of is that might be a big prior <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> um, maybe we'll watch some videos of, of snow because we never see it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Jenny, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Buy a bunch of shaved ice. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> I was just gonna say if you took a quick trip, um, of course, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure where you live, but just took a quick trip up to Tahoe and just filled a, you know, a, an ice cooler or something like that with snow. I had a truck and I drove up to Tahoe and I, I filled the whole bed with snow because um, in the area I taught, I had mostly Hmong students. And so they were used to warm weather and, and they never seen snow ever. They didn't know what it looked like. So we had a snowball fight in the parking lot at school, you know, because I filled the truck on Sunday 
Monday morning pulled in and the kids had a big old snow. Some of them climbed in the truck and were doing angels. And I'm like, okay, that's a little extreme. But but I was just thinking, um, I just posted a link. The, the nice set, Angela, is that how you say nice it? Set, yeah. Yeah, nice set actually has a, a whole page. I just posted a link on that. If you Google nanoscience of snowflakes, and nice set has a whole page on that with activities and going into the science of that. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, I'm I'm in LA, so I could maybe go to Big Bear <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> during a very narrow <laughs> time frame of the year. Um, yeah. That would be cool too, um, Usha, to make snow from kits. Yeah. There's also one that I, okay, I, I'm personally, I'm a winter person, even though I live in California now, but I recently really love snowflakes, so I was also curious about it. But there, um, there's all this like um, understanding behind or um, research behind this, um, the people who would photograph snowflakes and stuff like that. So it was really cool. Um, and I'm going to post it. It's this one that's um, with uh, the Smithsonian. Um, and he was this like pioneering photographer of snowflakes. And he had to like think about all the ways on how to, anyway, it was like a fun aside. That sounds cool. But I'll, I'll add that in the resource page. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments for um, Anna? Okay, so I think after that is Yannette. Also, I added the news ELA to the resource page because I thought that was really cool. And I'm going to add the other ones. I'm, I'm taking notes, but I can only do so much at the same time. Okay, awesome. So I think, yeah, uh, Yannette, you wanna, you're ready to present? Okay, awesome. Yeah. So I wanted to combine the coronavirus and nanoscience. So that's what my lesson is about. Um, I can start first with the um, virtual activity of this, uh, the scale of the universe simulation. And so in my PowerPoint, all you guys would have to do is just click here to explore the scale of the universe. And I think Angela did this activity on the first day, I wanna say. Um, and it's super neat um, to be able to do it on our end. I had a lot of fun uh, exploring that. Um, so the kids could do that and then um, these links were given to us um, in that document Angela gave us yesterday. So we could have students watch these three YouTube videos and they're not that long and they're, they're so good. I watched them all yesterday and I learned so much about the coronavirus. And so I really feel like it's so relevant because um, that's all anybody talks about right now. Um, so I came up with some YouTube questions right here, I think like five yeah, like five of them or more. And so I would when I have more time, I want to go back and um, I only had time to do one video. So I want to add YouTube questions for the other videos. Um, so just like how many nanometers long is the coronavirus? What kind of microscopes are mentioned in the videos? How can nanoscience aid us in our fight against the coronavirus? According to the video, can the coronavirus be overcome? And then what did you take away from the videos? So you guys could use those questions, um, you know, in any which way you guys would want to. So my activity for, for this, my thought is to make a poster or a Google slide, just like something simple. Um, and so the students would have to research and write about the symptoms of the coronavirus, facts that you've learned, ways to prevent the virus, and then you know how, how to treat it and specifically how to treat ARDS because coronavirus causes ARDS in the lungs. Um, and then um, here you guys would have to click, let me see if I could do it. So you would have to click and then it's gonna send you here to copy document. So then make a copy for yourselves. It's Google Drawings. And then this, this was what um, Angela, you gave to us. And so I just modified it for me and for us. So I just wrote out symptoms of the coronavirus, facts you learned, prevention, treatment. So that way students can type in um, their research using this uh, graphic organizer. Okay. And then, okay. So I, my thought process would be, be ready to present in breakout rooms. So if, if I was on Zoom, 
I think it would be fun to do breakout rooms and have them share amongst each other. Um, and then I, I do have a little rubric in case, um, you know, anybody needs a rubric or they want it, they like it. And then at the very end, um, you know, I did a lot of research as I'm sure you guys did too. So I found a whole bunch of additional resources that are just nanoscience and just nanotechnology related. Um, so I think you should be able to click on these links and I think you should be able to um, download them. So let me know if they don't work, but I think once I share this out with you, I think um, they say sharing, so they should work. Um, and that is all you guys, short and sweet. I would love any feedback. I love it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> Yay, I'm so glad. Um, my, my stuff really tied in with uh, Julia. Her scanning, I'm going to steal stuff from you guys too, so don't, don't even worry. Like the scanning probe, the how big is it, the surface area, the sweet self-assembly, like all of that totally ties in with this. So um, for sure, I'll be, you know, taking stuff from you guys too. Yeah. Unette, um, have you heard of Edpuzzle? Because you, you could use that application to, for your YouTube videos and put your questions in and the kids could answer it and you can get their feedback from that. Okay, I actually haven't used Edpuzzle, so I'm gonna learn it's how to It's super easy. You, you just take any YouTube video and you can put your questions in it and you can make them open-ended or multiple choice. And if you make a multiple choice, it'll grade it for you automatically. Great, thank you, Julia. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, me and Joanne um, during the spring actually taught an entire like, unit on the coronavirus. If you need any resources, videos or readings, uh, we have some links as well. Thank you so much, June. Yeah, this is going to be my first year teaching seventh and eighth grade science. So, definitely, you know, I'm I'm in need of all the things, all the resources I could get. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I'm also adding them to our remote learning section. Some of these um, things that you guys are saying, which is awesome. Um, anything else? I really like. I really like it. I think it's really fun. It's really relevant. And I love the idea with this Ed puzzle and using those videos. Cause yeah, I agree. You can't make them watch all those videos at once. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So um, it looks like we have Amy. So I am, this, this is an outline. There's a lot um, more research I wanted to do. So in seventh grade, we had um, learned, about, learned about physiology and, um, and the major body systems. And one of them was the digestive system. And then in that, we also tied in nutrition. And they looked at proteins, carbohydrates, um, lipids, and um, vitamins and minerals. And so I want to bring that, bring that back to them starting with the digest system. Oops. Um, so we'll refer back to that. And then, and then after we refer back to that, I'd like to show them how we detect these um, macromolecules, the proteins with the biuret solution, and the carbohydrates with um, iodine and the failing solution, and the brown paper test for lipids. And these solutions are used um, in the medical field, you can detect proteins in the urine and also um, carbohydrates in the urine. And so I'll show them how they can detect um, these substances in foods or whatever else they can think of so that they can see how that works. And so after we detect them, we'll also show other characteristics and properties of um, the proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. I will look at how they burn and how they respond to water and heating. So we'll first characterize the macromolecules. And then um, we will um, talk about how we ha also talked about this in our physiology block, how the proteins in your body are broken down to amino acids and carbohydrates into glucose, lipids into glycerol and fatty acids. So your body can use these substances. And um, but they're not the smallest units of these um, molecules. And so we are going to look at 
how everything actually in the world is made of molecules and atoms and talk about you know how the characteristics and behavior of these of the molecules and atoms at this level whether they are the, still the same um, as the macromolecules so to sort of um, segue way into the macromolecules into more of the nanosphere we'll look at the um, we'll use the how big is it activity that we used in um, this week to show them the different sizes. And then um, after we look at the different sizes, and we'll, we'll focus more on the nano um, particles and see, you know, how can we, how are those properties, how might those properties be different? We can look at the surface area um, and how the nano particles um, increase surface area and how that can be helpful. And we'll do the self-assembly activities um, and, the, and the gravity versus surface tension activity that Jenny has showed us with the, um, the cups and the thin film, just to sort of get, get an idea of what some of the properties of the nanoscale we're looking at. Um, then we'll talk about nanotechnology and try out the, um, you know, how the nano wafers are made and the photolithography activity, how that makes the nano um, products that can be used. And, um, and then also takes um, some lab tours of the clean room and the microscopes, hopefully, so that they can see how things are being used on, in the nano world. Um, and then, at the end, after they learn all this, we will look at the news articles and to see how it all ties together um, in how it's used today in the practical sense. And then also to tie it all back because with the, um, the news, all the things that they're using, I think, and also with the activities, we can tie everything back to the macromolecules that we started with and how, um, the liposomes are used in um, the food industry and the medical industry, and then also how um, the self-assembly is also part of the molecules and how the proteins um, form themselves in the same way. And um, I guess everything in the you know in nature does that. And um, with all this, so part of what we do is we are always writing and modeling with we. Um, at our school, we do a lot of hands-on activities where the children um, either do an experiment themselves or they watch me do one. And then we look at what we observe, the phenomena, and then we decide what is a phenomena and what is, might be happening um, behind the phenomena. And so it's a lot of it's based on observation and what we can experience. And that's um, how our, we do our science at our school. And so, um, yeah, so I'm just hoping to tie everything back together and how nanoscience is in, it's, it, it's everywhere in our world. So that's just the beginning of what I am working on. And I, you know, I need to do more research just to, to fill in the different places with this outline. Yeah, thank you. So, I'm, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, did I interrupt you? It's okay. No, my internet connection is really bad and it's very staticky. I hope you heard what I said. Yeah, we did. I think you did a great job. I think it was really interesting that you started with chemistry and then end up in nanotechnology where you're, the way you're introducing from one unit into another. I like that. Um, do you, does anyone have any questions or comments? Oh, Jenny? <laughs> I was just going to say one really awesome tie-in, Amy, that popped in my head was about surface area of our organs. Since you started off talking about surface area in the beginning, for instance, something I would ask the kids is, why is our esophagus only this long, but our intestines are this long? How come they have to go all over the place? How come they can't just go straight? Like our esophagus is straight. And, you know, mm -hmm. even looking at the interior, if you wanted to get into the different kind of microscopes and looking at the interior, why do we have all these little villi 
in our in our small intestines, you know, for the purposes of absorption. I would just ask them why. Why are the organs designed the way that they are, and how does that tie in with surface area and maximizing our ability to absorb the nutrients, etc.? Yeah, or even your honestly uh, taste buds. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, thank you. No, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's yeah. Thank you so much. That'll be helpful to tie it all back in together again. So we talked about it a little bit last year, so it's good to bring it all back in. So they can refer, you know, all these things, concepts apply in many, many different places. So it's great for them to see that, to be able to look at the world that way. So thank you. All right. Any, any other questions? Okay. All right. So I think we have maybe one more person. I think that might be me. If we're forgetting someone else. Two more people. Okay. Amy, I'm Does someone want to go before me? I'm happy to go. Yeah, it's Leo. It's between. It's the two gentlemen of our group. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. I'm gonna go unless Leo is convincing me he wants to go first. Go for <laughs> it. Go for it. All right. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. Uh, can you see my screen and can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. So I am lazy. I did not make a PowerPoint. Um, I don't, I'm going to put this away so that you could see everything. Um, so uh, I wanted to think about astronomy just because I have no curriculum for that class and I wanted to develop something, at least for the beginning. Um, and I wanted to start off with the, um, what is it called? How big is it activity? But before they actually start the activity, I want them to get familiar with um, scientific notation. And I want them to need scientific notation. I don't want to make them learn scientific notation. The goal uh, for me is so that they are really struggling with the math comparing the big things and the small things. And I can provide scientific notation to them as a tool that they can use and feel empowered by instead of burdened by. Um, so one activity that I wanted to try to do is I already have microscopes in my classroom. And I was thinking if there was a way to measure small things for the students to actually measure small things. So I looked online and I found uh, ocular micrometer, little glass lenses you can see right here. And then this is a cell and you can actually see the number line here and the units. Um, so I'd ask them first, uh, what is the diameter of an onion? So I just get like a whole onion, maybe give each group of four uh, onion and they'd have to measure the diameter of the onion itself. And I give them a red onion so they don't have to mess with any coloring of anything. You can just peel it off and throw it in the microscope. Um, and then I'd have them measure the size of an onion cell. Um, and for a lot of students, just using the measurements is going to be uh, enough content for them. But there are students that are going to be able to measure things really easily. And I'd want them uh, as an extension question or an optional question is how much bigger is the whole onion, onion's diameter from the diameter of, let's say, the nucleus of that one cell. Um, so that they can start to mess with all the zeros that come after the decimal place and and start to struggle with that a little bit. Um, and then also other things, I just uh, had length of a human hair versus the width of a human hair that, and maybe some other things that they can just measure with the microscope. So that's kind of like a day one activity, part one. Um, and after that part two uh, is to look at the big scale. So for group of four, I'm gonna give them a very long string and a meter stick and I'll have them go outside and measure maybe the basketball court or maybe measure the field or across the school or something if they're feeling um, prestigious. Um, and then I could ask another um, question about how much bigger is the basketball court from the onion nucleus, just to really get them frustrated with all the zeros. And then I would introduce scientific notation to them, um, and maybe back inside the classroom at the end of this class. Um, and they could start playing with all their data and all the numbers that they've collected and see how scientific notation is something that um, isn't a burden, that it actually makes their lives easier. Um, 
And then I wanted to end class with the question, if you stacked all the humans on top of each other that exist today, um, if you just took every single human that exists right now and just stacked them on top of each other, how long uh, would that be? And just let them throw some numbers out there. But I wouldn't give them the answer until the next day. Um, so for part three, I would do the how big is it activity, except I would add the space scale to the end of the car list. So it would go all the way um, down to the atom size, um, but it would also extend all the way out to the observable universe, uh, just like this activity. So I'd want them to do the um, card sort and I want them to put things on it, but I would also want them to interact with this at the same, maybe not at the same time, but within the same um, uh, day or the same lesson. Um, and so they can get the answer to the question from the day before and how the total human height is uh, one times 10 to the 10 meters, which is actually uh, bigger than our sun, uh, the diameter of our sun. So you can see the sun here and the human all stacked up on top of each other are a lot bigger, which I thought was really cool. Um, and then obviously they can zoom in and out and play with this. And what's cool is you can click on things and read about them and go all the way in. And what's cool is that when you go all the way to the bottom, let me just go all the way to the bottom real quick. Um, it actually shows like the fundamentals of the of uh, physics here. The uh, I think my computer is freezing. Quantum. Oh my goodness! I did not mean to do that. All right, I give up on this. All right, but you get the picture. I think I want them to start thinking of the really small things and the really big things, and then um, by this time they see scientific notation as something really powerful and useful, and not something as is another thing to learn. And then the next lesson, I want to answer the question. So a lot of kids are gonna be saying, well, space is really big. Why do we care about nanoscience and nanotechnology? Um, and so I want them to interact with a bunch of phenomenon through things like in the Nan New Space article. Um, I'd probably break it up into table rotation because whenever I give students more than five minutes of reading to do at a time, they just check out. But for some reason, if you organize them into a table rotation, they just, can go the whole period and still want more. Um, so uh, just give them a bunch of phenomenon talked about, um, uh, like the space elevator and carbon nanotubes. And the if you decrease the mass of a payload on top of a rocket, you significantly decrease how much fuel you need to get into orbit and to travel and explore around. So I think that will just get them interested in and see that nanotechnology is really important for spacesuits and everything. And then the part five of this lesson, I had two different ideas. I wanted something kind of like a fun since the beginning activity, like a get like a silly thing to do. Um, the one idea I had would be to uh, do that uh, carbon nanotube engineering design, except give them something like spaghetti and marshmallows, and they'd have to use tweezers and oven and have oven mitts for hands or something ridiculous just for them to try to build the tallest carbon nanotube tower and realize it's really difficult. And that's the lesson that working with nanotechnology is really difficult. Um, and, uh, or another idea I had was something to, to go back to the, using the microscopes and using the, um, the what's it called? Ocular micro, micrometer. I don't even know if I'm saying that. I might be messing that up. Micrometer or micrometer. Um, uh, to draw something or make something like, like a challenge of who can draw the smallest smiley face or something, and then they can measure it and compete with each other and then get the idea that using a pencil to just draw like the tiniest dot, they look underneath the microscope, it's probably just going to be huge and they'll be just get the idea that creating small things is really difficult because I just wanted them to have a sense of scale for what they can interact with and then be able to show them things in like electron microscopes and they have an idea that's so much smaller so it gives them a little realm of what they can mess with so yeah that's everything i'll stop sharing my screen and i'm happy for any feedback Is there are any other ideas yeah um i actually really like your idea of incorporating the ocular like micometer and um, I definitely think I'm going to do that next year when I teach about microscopes. That sounds very interesting. Like just to be able to measure things that small. 
I was thinking, because um, we did do onions as well in our class, um, looking at onion skins, the nucleus is really small. Um, yeah. yeah. And I was, looking, I was looking at the size of a nucleus of uh, onion cell. It's like 10 micrometers. And a lot of the ones that you, like the micrometers I found on Amazon, like only went down to like 0 0.1 milliliters. So I like, oh, okay. So I, I, I'm questioning that if it's going to be able even to like uh, able to measure uh, the nucleus or not. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't messed with units. I, whenever I've done the uh, microscopes and observing things, they're just making observations and drawing it. I've never thought to have a measure, try to measure things. So yeah, I, even I need to learn some stuff Wait about how that works. So you could get a, you could, it's very likely you could find an image and then have a scale bar and print it out so they can just measure it on the macro scale and then translate mm. that measurement into whatever the, the actual size is. Kind of okay. like, you know, a map. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, oh, another thing was your last part with the tiny writing or the tiny drawing. I think mm -hmm. that is a really fun, and the marshmallow one, but the tiny writing, I remember seeing, um, and this could just be like a hook, but um, people used to carve like tiny images on the tip of a pencil. Ooh, that's Has neat. anyone seen that before or heard of that before? Yeah, it's crazy, but it could be like a sort of like challenge to the kids. Yeah, I want to try to find something like that where they can try to manipulate something really. So like maybe, yeah, on a grain of rice or. Yeah, yeah. Leo's putting uh, the rice grain stuff too. Yeah. yeah, so if anyone thinks of anything like that, I'll, I'll write down all the ideas. So that's cool. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I think Leo. Last but not least. I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, it's been awesome bouncing ideas around. I'm always reminded of my teacher training where the professor said, beg, borrow, steal. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of bio and I wanted to get really kind of like nitty gritty with the mechanics of um, the central dogma of biology. And so just wanted to show this quick clip where uh, one go. kind of fell in the love with this video from my bio DNA professor. Is reading the gene. And um, I just love it's how there's assembly the going on. And copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the... So I was thinking about this video for a long time before writing my lesson plan. And uh, here's kind of my work in progress. Um, nothing solid, but definitely something um, that I'm going to refine and distill. Um, I'm still trying to set the audience. Uh, so right now, I think this is targeted towards high school. Just shows high school just because it is a slightly harder topic. Um, but I'm still thinking about how I can distill it down to the middle school. Um, I, I think I'm just gonna skip over the expectations and everything, so um, I'm just gonna jump down. Um, I basically took a high school performance expectation where they are going to stu study the structure of DNA and uh, use it to analyze proteins. Um, specific learning outcomes, I was thinking like, how do things behave at the nanoscale? Attraction, repulsion, what are the building blocks of proteins? What is DNA? How does DNA code proteins? What are the organization, organizational layers of proteins? Um, and then I'm just gonna jump down to my lesson plan. Um, really quickly, I just love the cherries effect. So I was hoping to use the cherries effect and just for them to just have a bowl of cereal and to look at it. Um, and then to just kind of have them analyze what might happen with uh, the, the floating assembly. Just dishing it out kind of like an icebreaker just to engage them and ask them to kind of flip the pieces uh, up and down like we did and to see that molecular attraction. Um, and then to actually go back, take out the Cheerios, grind it down and pull out the iron filings with a magnet. So, I mean, just to show them that, you know, this demo that I'm giving them is actually the Cheerios effect in essence. Um, for them to explore um, building up uh, I was hoping that they would then start to think about Lego self-assembly. Can we use charge to achieve pattern recognition? Uh, allow students to play very arrangements and record their observations. Um, whoops, I think I skipped over something. 
ah, I did. Um, and so from that, I was hoping that they would actually go with a little bit of a conceptual building where they were talking about like the coding of it, like how would they code the magnets so that it would align correctly. Um, then I think the explain is kind of a, a chance for me to kind of integrate my lesson and also my lecture notes. So here is like my formal lesson on like what's happening, what went well, errors, troubleshooting techniques, error correction for like how they refine their coding. Uh, but more importantly, um, I think it's a chance and opportunity for me to teach about DNA. Um, here I have a structure of a nucleotide. I, I really wanted to use that charge magnetic attraction. I, I still haven't refined this yet, but thinking about like how to use that to establish the anti-parallel strands on the sugar phosphate backbone, and also then to orient um, like the, the triple and double bonds of C and G uh, here. Um, to kind of look at like, you know, how we can play with Legos and actually how we can arrange them so that they could actually create a nucleotide using fictitious Lego pieces. And I love how I got to go into my group and kind of bounce our ideas around with Vicky and Amrit. And they mentioned like, you know, maybe I should use four Lego colors so that it's ATCG. And also to think about like, you know, um, and then to use that to do this idea of like having it lock into like anti-parallel strands. From there, I was thinking that it could be further elaborated through replication and um, DNA transcription translation, where they actually started to think about like how they would actually build a 3D model. And here I just have like a, a fictitious image that I pulled from Google. Um, but then to then to think about what they would build in terms of a protein. And I think that's it. Um, last but not least. Um, some of the evaluations were like, you know, what is DNA structure? What is transcription? What is translation? What is replication? And I thought a good summative project with them for them to build a comic book or uh, a poster uh, representing the central dogma of biology from DNA to RNA to proteins. That's it. That's really cool. I like, I like the, um, the uh, connecting the self assembly with DNA, um, that whole activity. One thought I had is with the magnets, you could attach them to even like string or even like pipe cleaners somehow. I don't know exactly how, but somehow, um, which I thought would be a good idea. Um, but yeah, any other questions or comments? I know we're, we're running a little out of time, but um, I just want to make sure everyone gets their fair share. What grade does he teach? Leo? Oh, I, I teach um, middle school, but I also teach um, nine through 12 occasionally. There we go. That's why I, I was like, these are some like kind of advanced cop, uh, you know, like high school topics. So just wondering, but I mean, it's always good to challenge the student. So it's fine. This is definitely set for my freshman group uh, and definitely not towards the middle school, but I'm thinking of ways to make it like fun and manageable and bite-sized pieces for the middle school. Yeah, very good job. Great. Is there anything else that anyone wanted to add or share? Okay, well, I just want to give a round of applause to everybody. I think you all did an awesome job um, given the time and the circumstance. Um, and yeah, I'm just really appreciative of everybody for dedicating this amount of time. Um, it couldn't have been easy. Um, it, hopefully it was a little fun. I know a lot of it can drag on because, you know, who wants to be online for this long? But um, anyway, I just want to say I appreciate all of that. Um, I also want to give a big, big shout out to all the support I got from in front of the scenes and behind the scenes from um, Jenny and Karithika. I think they did an amazing job um, supporting us. I kind of threw this at them and said, hey, do you want to try this? And they did, and they really, they really did an amazing, awesome job. So um, big, big shout out to the, the two of them. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, would there be a shared Google Drive where we can share our lessons? Yes, so we do have some, you know, mini homework, I would say. So there's the form, obviously, the SU21. I got most of yours for your stipends. There's also the post survey. Again, please, please, please do the post survey. I really need you to do that. Um, and then your final task is to submit your lesson plan. And so your lesson plan will be the um, on, uh, it should be posted here, but I can, I think I should be able to um, share it maybe. 
Let's see. Again, sorry, I'm still trying to figure out how to do this. Okay, most of you guys turned it in already, actually, now that I'm seeing, but um, I wonder if I can. Okay. I'll post it again in the classroom and like try to cross post it. I don't know how to do that, but we'll figure it out. Um, worst case, I'll, I'll, I will send a summative email for, for everyone on all of this. And basically the biggest thing is the resource page, which you'll have, which has all the links to everything, including this drive folder where you'll put all your lesson plans. Um, and yeah, let me try to think through, is there anything before we all leave? So yeah, again, the resource page, it'll be on Google Classroom. I won't delete it. Um, oh, one thing is that expectations for the school year uh, for next year. So ideally, you know, by the end of the next school year, you'll have implemented in your classroom, either remotely or in person, who knows what will happen. But um, there is a form. Um, and I think I posted it in the Google Classroom. But there's also a link in the slides. And I'll send that also as a separate email. So you can have that information. Um, and then usually we do a follow up in person in the fall. So this is, yeah, exactly. I hope we can all sort of, you know, meet back up or even meet back up virtually. I know some people are not in person, but generally speaking, do you think we can come up with a general consensus on when we could meet again? Would it be like late fall? Like, I think what we did was like October, like a Saturday program in October or no, early November. Anybody? Any general thoughts? Or we're, it's just too far down the line. Did you do, do you want to send a survey? Like, you know, the Google survey? Sure, I can send you a survey. But if you can just rough out, like, the timing. Okay, early November is generally, okay. I can send out some weekend dates on um, early November. But in the yeah. meantime, I want to say that we can also set up and I'll send this along with the survey, is probably um, any office hours. I can hold sort of open office hours. So you can either drop in or um, we can sort of maybe come to a certain day consensus where we just hang out for like an hour, talk about things, any challenges, any things that you wanna go over. Um, and then the other thing is that I do plan on posting all these videos. So I plan, I have an agenda um, and I'll post the agenda with, the videos that are associated with that agenda. So you can review um, my ramblings <laughs> if you choose. Um, and then um, I think that's it. So we'll, we'll work on some virtual check-ins because I think we should use this to our advantage. Um, and, and yeah, I think that about does it. Let me see if there's anything else. Um, and then, yeah, so the resources like for the future, you know, you can always email me, you can always email Je Jenny and Kritka. Um, also, we have staff. Um, if you want, I can also share everyone's email, like I can share the roster if everyone is okay. So I guess it sounds like everyone is okay. So if I, anyone is not okay with sharing the information, the email information, um, please let me know. I won't post it until probably early next week, I'll send up a follow-up email on Friday. I mean, not Friday, tomorrow's Friday. On Monday, sort of cumulatively sharing all the information out. But if anyone is not okay, please let me know. So I'll send out the email so you can connect with each other if you want. And then, yeah, the resource page is all that information, okay? So with that, um, yeah, I think you have all the, all the components, you have all the information. Just please send me this 20, the stipend, the um, post survey, and send me your lesson plan. And if you aren't able to um, upload it, feel free to just email it to me directly. All right, and then the stipends, they may take a little while to process. They usually take at least two weeks, if not more, um, depending on if there's any typos, et cetera, et cetera. It's a kind of an administrative nightmare, but we'll get there. Um, so I may need to email you back and forth. But um, yeah, if there's anything else to add, I think we'll, we can sign off now. I'm sad that I didn't get to meet you in person, but I hope that, yeah, someday we can. Um, and yeah, I think that about does it. Yeah.
Angela, you're not going to tell him what a super stellar, uh, especially um, awesome, amazing, uh, talented <laughs> group of folks they are? They are. They are. Did I not say that? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Is that what I told the last year? No, every year is different. Every, word, every year, every, all the adjectives are different. <laughs> but honestly, it. like, sorry? Jenny's making us feel bad now. Come I on. know, right? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I think everyone has been great. Every time, like, whenever I get, I always get nervous. This year, I was especially nervous because it was remote. You never know what's going on. Um, but every year, I'm just really surprised and impressed with all the teachers that come. So um, I, I am, you know, really appreciative. You guys are all stars. So, yeah, and remote enthusiasts. I like that. Okay. All right. Well, I will be here. I'll spend a little time. Um, I don't know if Jenny and Krithika, you want to do another debrief, but um, other than that, um, best of luck. Goodbye. I will see you on the internet again. Okay.